Hello Year 9. This is the third lesson in this booklet on Year 9 Health in Biology. The next topic we're going to go on to after alcohol is disease and the different ways that um, we can end up with infections and with certain diseases. So you need to turn in your booklet for me please to page 17, thank you. So there are several ways in which the body can go wrong. Sometimes in cancer, for instance, which is what we're going to have a look at today, cells in the body behave in an abnormal way. They don't do what they should do normally. Our body cells are constantly dividing in our skin, in our hair, in our nails, in our bones, okay, and in all of your body organs. Before they split into two genetically identical cells, they copy their DNA. So imagine this is a little bit like putting a sheet of paper on a photocopier and pressing the copy button. Hopefully what you'd get out the other end would be an exact copy of the piece of paper that you'd put onto the machine. However, occasionally the machine might need new ink, new toner, new paper. The piece of paper may not have been put on quite square onto the photocopier or there might be a little bit of tipex left on the um, photocopier screen. And so what comes out is not always exactly the same. This is a little bit like when your cells divide. Occasionally the cell makes a mistake when it makes a copy. And we call this mistake, apologies, we call this mis mistake a mutation, okay? Um, a mutation can occur just completely randomly. It can occur because we've been exposed to something that causes a mutation, but it also occurs more often as we get older. Some of these mutations can be harmful and they can cause the cell to change and start to divide rapidly out of control. And this is what happens in cancer. The cells form a growth or a lump called a tumour. And sometimes this tumour is what we describe as being benign. In other words, it's not harmful. And sometimes it is malignant. It is harmful. So we're going to look a little bit more at the difference between benign and um, uh, malignant tumours a little bit later. Either way, the lump often needs to be removed to prevent either the spread of these cells and in some cases further treatment like chemotherapy or radiotherapy is used to target um, destroying any remaining cancerous cells to stop it spreading. Or if it's a benign tumour, it may just need removing because it's in an awkward place or it may be putting pressure on a blood vessel or a nerve um, or it may be affecting things like the shape of the eyeball in the head, okay, so that vision is sometimes distorted. So even though it's not harmful itself as a tumour, it's harmful because of its position. So there is this sheet which I've put onto Moodle as a separate sheet, so you can either um, print it out or you can see it uh, in large. This is a sheet for Macmillan Cancer Support and it's on what is cancer, the facts, okay? Because all too often we hear things from other people and they may not necessarily be true, okay? So we want to make sure that you are getting the facts about cancer and so does Macmillan Cancer Support. So what I would like you to do, this is a reading behaviour exercise. I want you to read through the information on what is cancer, the facts. And then I'm also going to give you on Moodle um, a document where there are cards. Now, normally in a lesson, these would be already printed out for you. They'd be cut out and you'd be working in groups and you're going to put those cards into two piles, whether you think those cards are factual statements, real statements, okay, um, or whether they're fiction, whether they're not um, right, they're not correct. So pause the video. If you need to either open up the document to make it a little bit bigger to read, then please do so on what is cancer the facts and then open up the document for the card sort. And I want you to try and put those statements into the table on page 17, deciding whether they're fact or fiction. So these are the fact or fiction card sort statements if you haven't opened up that document. So as I said, um, read through them. There are nine of them and decide whether they go into the fact or the fiction column, please. Pause the video. 
So we're going to go over whether these statements are fact or fiction and we're going to explain some of them in a bit more detail. So, fact, true. The earlier someone gets treated for their cancer, the better. This is true if a cancer is diagnosed and treated at a very early stage when the cancer hasn't spread that far, the chances of the person surviving are a lot higher. A fiction, a false cancer is contagious. Contagious means you can catch it, okay? You cannot catch cancer from anybody else. Another true Cancer is much more common among older people and this is because as we said as you get older your cells when they divide make more mistakes. It can though affect anyone, okay, mainly older people, nearly two-thirds, about 64% of people who get cancer are over the age of 65. A false, there are 12 different types of cancer. There are actually more than over 200 types of cancer. Any part of your body can get cancer. It can occur anywhere. Lung cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic, um, brain cancer, skin cancer, every type of organ you have and tissue can get cancer, okay? When these cells start to divide out of control. Uh, a true, a benign tumour is non-cancerous and a malignant tumour is cancerous. This is true. A benign tumour isn't actually cancer, um, so to speak, and it can often be removed easily through surgery. Cancer is the name given to something called a malignant tumour, a tumour that has the ability to spread to other places and to grow rapidly out of control um, and cause damage to that organ. Another fiction, cancer makes your hair fall out. This is false. The cancer itself does not cause hair loss, but actually some treatments like radio and chemo can cause side effects including hair loss. But any hair loss during the treatment will almost always grow back, sometimes a different texture or colour. So people have reported if they had straight hair, the hair that grew back after their cancer treatment was curly and vice versa, okay, or slightly different colour or texture. The number of people living with cancer in the UK is increasing. This is a true fact. Um, whether that's because we're identifying it more, particularly early because of testing, um, but certainly with treatments improving and the population aging, there are more people living with the illness than ever before, two million and counting. And it's quite likely that you know somebody with cancer or has had cancer. Another fiction is cancer cannot be treated, it's incurable. This is false. Treatments for cancer are often very successful and many people do recover completely and go on to live normal lives. However, there are a lot of um, different reasons why some cancers seem to be more aggressive and seem to um, cause more damage to the body and can result, unfortunately, in somebody losing their life. And the very last statement, the ninth one, I want to share with you because it says it's best not to talk about cancer because it's uncomfortable and depressing. Now, you may have decided this goes in fact or fiction, and I'm not going to say either one is wrong um, because it is debatable. Certainly, some people find it really hard to talk about a serious illness like cancer. But on the other hand, cancer is part of everyday life. And the more we talk about it, the more we can understand. Sometimes not talking about something can make it seem scarier and lead to confusion. So what do you think? Do you think it's a fact or do you think it's a fiction? And there is no wrong answer for this, okay? So we're going to learn a little bit more about the disease cancer. First of all, we're going to start to look at some risk factors for cancer, okay? So what are the risk factors that might increase our chance of developing cancer at some point in our lives? So some of these are hereditary factors. What we mean by this is you inherit certain factors, certain faults in your gene that might make you more likely to develop certain types of cancer. This is certainly true for cancers like breast cancer, they often can run in families, and that's why it's really important that um, people get tested regularly, especially if they know there's been cancer in the family previously. Smoking definitely increases the risk of cancer. We see this with lung cancer in particular, but also throat cancer. 
your diet can increase the risk of cancer. So um, it's been a, a known fact that in Australia, they have higher incidence of a bowel cancer from people eating more barbecued food. That doesn't mean you can't eat barbecued food, but if it's got more um, charcoal, more um, of the burnt bits, I suppose, on the outside, if you're not great at cooking your barbecued food, um, then this can increase the risk. And also high fat in your diet, okay, and other um, things that we eat. Radiation, exposure to radiation. Now, nobody intends to be exposed to radiation. However, sometimes this can happen um, when you have uh, an x-ray, for example, the radiographer will stand outside the room. That's not because it's dangerous, okay? Although for her or him, okay, if they were to be in the room for every time an x-ray occurred, they would be getting too much dosage of radiation of the x-rays okay so that's why they stand outside the room but certainly things like um, radiation from nuclear power stations okay if there's been a leakage so in the uh, disaster that happened Chernobyl okay um, we saw increased risks of developing cancer okay and death from people who were actually um, right in the epicenter where Chernobyl actually uh, happened um, other risk factors we've got on here are chemicals, certain chemical, what we call this posh word here, carcinogen, okay? A carcinogen is a potential cancer-causing chemical. So we know things like petrol, smelling petrol, okay, um, being exposed to too much of the, the smell of it, okay, is a potential carcinogen. That doesn't mean it's unsafe to fill up your car with petrol, okay? But just sniffing it, okay, smelling chemicals, never a good idea, okay? We always um, say don't sniff any chemicals in class and certain microbes can increase the risk of cancer so we're going to see this definitely with um, the HPV virus and how it increases the risk of cervical cancer later on so I want you to think about what happens to normal cells when DNA is damaged does this happen to cancer cells how does this enable cancer cells to form huge tumours? And can you think of another effect of mutation which may promote um, or cause tumour formation? So these questions are on page 18 and we've got this diagram here showing us a, I don't like using this word, normal cell, a regular cell, okay, with its nucleus and its chromosomes and we've got a cancer cell. Now normally in a normal cell there's unfixable DNA damage, the cell will die, there'll be cell death, okay. Um, in a cancerous cell for some reason the cells do not die, they carry on dividing, okay. And we're going to talk about this young lady on the right here in a second, okay, and her condition and what she has been through, okay, um, with her cancer. So pause the video, see if you can answer those questions to the starter. They start off easy and they get a little bit harder and then we'll go over them. So what happens to normal cells when DNA is damaged? It basically they die okay as we said um, normally they would die does this happen to cancer cells no how does this enable cancer cells to form such huge tumors well they can continue to divide without control okay out of control division and can you think of a mutation which may promote tumor formation a mutation that causes either cell division cell death or what we call resistance to drugs. Resistance to drugs means um, the cell doesn't get destroyed by a particular drug or a chemical, okay? So write those answers to the starters as requested. And we're going to have a look at the young lady. Remember, I'm just gonna go back a second so that you can see her. This young lady here, okay, and what had happened to her, okay, for her face to change so much, okay, like this, and it looks extremely uncomfortable and not very pleasant. So, this is a true story. Um, the girl who got her smile back. Doctors actually have removed a melon-sized tumour, so think about the size of a melon from this 12-year-old girl's face. She was a prisoner in her own body, struggling to eat and breathe before undergoing life-saving operation. So she was forced to wear a scarf around her face to hide it because she was um, embarrassed, okay, about what it looked like. 
and she couldn't even smile and she was beginning to find it difficult to breathe and to eat food okay because of the size of the tumor so janet silva from gambia is ecstatic after doctors removed the six pound benign tumor in new york okay and this is what she looks like today okay she's definitely got her smile back and she's so much happier now that she's able to eat to breathe okay and feel that she hasn't got this huge tumor that she was carrying around with her that disfigured her face so today we're going to look at identifying and telling the difference that's what differentiate means telling the difference between what a malignant tumor is and a benign tumor and explaining how cancer can spread okay so we can see these um, objectives we're going to state what a tumor is we're going to say what the difference is between benign and malignant tumors we're going to explain how cancer can spread and how we can treat it and we're going to finally apply our knowledge to a past paper question so what are tumor cells they do not respond to the normal mechanisms that control the cell cycle in other words cells normally go through a process of dividing um, in a regular pattern and tumor cells don't respond in that way this allows them to divide rapidly so we can see this in the animation and as they divide rapidly going from one cell to two two to four four to eight eight to sixteen they form a lump of cells a tumor and this lump of cells can get bigger and bigger and some of these tumor cells can break off and start to spread to other places so the human papillomavirus hpv i mentioned it earlier and you might have heard of hpv because the girls um, in year nine and in year 10 normally get vaccinated against hpv virus there is um a a, th a, a kind of movement of people at the moment that are arguing the case for boys to be vaccinated against HPV. Um, HPV causes cervical cancer. Now, obviously, males do not have a cervix, okay? Um, so, human papillomavirus can't cause cervical cancer in boys. However, boys can carry this HPV virus, okay? And because it's spread through sexual contact, it means that um, boys can pass the HPV virus to girls and they could then call they could develop cervical cancer so who knows perhaps in the next few years boys you might be getting that vaccination at the same time the girls do so this is the reason why women are um requested to have a smear test okay um when they hit the age of uh, 18 and over uh, they will be invited every couple of years okay to come and have a hpv test in the hpv test uh, they just take a smear from the cervix. So you've already seen these diagrams back in the first unit, okay, of the reproductive organs in women. And they take a little smear, a swab, okay, from the cervix area, um, and they grow up the cells in the cervix to check whether there are any abnormal cancerous cells that can develop into cervical cancer. Cervical cancer um, can kill people, okay, if it's left undetected. So it's really important that young women and girls go and get this test done every year all the way up to um, when you go through menopause okay so benign tumors they are normally contained in one place usually within a membrane and as we said they are not cancerous okay so they don't invade other parts of the body but they can still grow quickly so to give you an example of somebody with an extreme case of benign tumors OK, uh, they can be dangerous, by the way, if they put pressure on a d or damage an organ. But this um, example here, this is a benign tumour, OK, growing on the eyelid of somebody here. And it would be annoying. It would be irritating. Um, so it would be fairly simple to remove that under a local anaesthetic. Um, it would be sore and uncomfortable afterwards with a couple of stitches. OK, but they do not cause cancer. So this picture is a little bit more. This poor lady here has a type of disease called neurofibromatosis type 1. And this poor grandmother um, from 2014, she has these little bubbles of tumours growing all over her body here um, that are causing a huge problem for her, okay? And obviously trying to remove all of them would be very, very difficult, okay? 
So what's the difference between benign and malignant? So a malignant tumour can spread around the body and invade neighbouring and healthy um, tissues. Cells may break up and they can enter the blood or the lymphatic system. So I've got a little video to show you how that would happen in animation. And they can then lodge into another organ and form a secondary tumour. So I'm just going to show you the video here. Don't worry about this complicated word metastasis, okay? And because it's an American video, they pronounce metastasis slightly differently to how we do in the UK. But I just want you to watch the video, okay, to understand how cancer can spread in malignant tumours. Most cancer deaths are caused by metastatic cancer. Metastasis occurs when cancer cells break off from the original tumor, which is also called the primary tumor, travel through the body and begin to grow in other tissues and organs. Metastasis causes death by damaging important organs, such as the brain, lungs, and liver. Cancer cells continually break off from the primary tumor. Some of these cells may move into nearby blood vessels and lymph vessels, Cancer cells can travel along these vessel highways to other parts of the body. Many cancer cells die while traveling through the blood and lymph vessels, but some may survive and stick to the vessel wall, then move through the vessel wall into another body tissue. These cells may then divide and form a metastatic tumor. Where are cancer cells most likely to spread? Cancer cells tend to spread to certain places in the body depending on the site where the tumor first formed. For example, breast cancer tends to spread to the bones, lungs, liver, and brain. And colon cancer tends to spread to the lungs and liver. It's important to remember that a metastatic tumor is the same type of cancer as the primary tumor. In this example, colon cancer cells have traveled through blood vessels and formed metastatic tumors in the liver. These metastatic tumors are colon cancer, not liver cancer. Metastatic colon cancer is usually treated with drugs and other therapies used to treat colon cancer. Researchers at the National Cancer Institute and other research organizations are studying metastasis and ways to prevent it. Preventing metastasis will help prevent many cancer deaths. Okay, so hopefully that's a little bit of information about malignant tumors. So what causes cancer? Well, we've already described some of those, uh, what we call risk factors. So this is Angelina Jolie here. And Angelina Jolie had a, um, what we call a double mastectomy back in 2017. A mastectomy is where the breast is removed. And people often go through this, have this done, um, either if they have cancer or if they think there's an increased risk of them developing cancer because it's um, in their family, okay? Because their mothers before them may have had breast cancer. So there's an increased risk of you inheriting things like breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So they will always test you on a regular basis if your um, mother had, these two uh, had one of these two cancers. So that's one of the risk factors. Mutations, as we've already described, and this can be caused by being exposed to chemicals like tar and asbestos or being exposed to radiation. Okay. We've got ionizing radiation, as we've just described. UV light is more likely to cause skin cancer, which is why they recommend that you put your suntan lotion on. High factor, SPF kind of 30 plus at least if you're going on holidays, okay? and expose you to um, excessive x-rays. So they don't recommend you have more than two or three x-rays a year, okay? Um, if you're accident prone, they might suggest that you have um, a, a different method of finding out if you've broken a bone. <clears throat> so this young lady here, um, 22, died from skin cancer, from exposure to too much UV light, not using sun protection sunscreen. You can see severe burns on this young lady here from um, sunbathing. And um, the damage that we see, you don't often see it instantly. It's only as you age, you can see the difference between this young man's face on the left and actually the exposure that UV radiation has done to his skin. So it's always an idea to wear that sun protection factor. 
and around 15% of cancers can be caused by viruses, by viral infections like the HPV. So that's why we vaccinate teenage girls in the UK against the um, human papillomavirus, that's what say HPV stands for. So we can limit um, HPV by limiting sexual partners and we could um, make sure that we use a condom, okay, um, to reduce the risk of spread of um, HPV. Now, we would normally do this challenge beat the question grid in class. I just want you to pause the video and see if you could answer those questions, okay? You don't need to write anything down, okay? But see if you could answer them, um, and then we'll go over the answers in a second. So I'll go over the answers to these in a second. Page 19 in your book, we've got five questions that hopefully you should be able to answer now from the information I've given you about what is a tumour, what's the difference between benign and malignant, describe some causes of cancer, some types of cancer, explain how cancer spreads and some ways we treat cancer, which is what we're going to look at um, in a second. Okay, um, so you can go back, you can rewind the video, okay, to go and find some of this information, okay? So the answers to those questions that you had, check what you've got, okay? I'm just going to put them up on the board here so that you can see them. And then go back to the questions. So if you rewind the video, you'll be able to see what the answer is to each question. As I say, we normally play this as a quiz in a normal lesson, so it doesn't quite work on a video recording. So for that one question at the bottom of page 19, identify some ways we treat cancer. You may have heard of these methods that we use. So cancer can be difficult to treat due to the way it spreads. In some cases, it's easy to remove a, a benign lump because it will just be in one place. It won't have spread. But with malignant cancer, it's a little bit more difficult. We sometimes will use radiotherapy and the cancer cells are destroyed by, might seem a bit bizarre that radiation normally causes cancer, but we actually use targeted doses of radiation to destroy the cancer cells Okay, where they are in the body. So this would be if you've got a lump in one particular place. But it can damage nearby healthy cells. So this is the problem. So they may use something like this type of machinery to actually target where the tumour is, okay, and make sure they give it a very high dose of radiation. It will make people feel extremely sick and very unwell, okay, during this treatment. But normally it's done for a, a period of time, and then they look at the results to see what's happened to the size of the tumour and if it's reduced. Second method of treating cancer, okay, is using chemicals. And again, we've already said that some chemicals cause cancer, but there are some chemicals that are used in chemotherapy that will actually stop these cells that are dividing out of control. They stop them dividing or they cause them to go into like self-destruct mode. So it's almost causing them to um, uh, die, okay, so that they don't spread to other places. And again, chemotherapy comes with side effects which are not very pleasant, okay. So this question is not in your book. This is actually a GCSE question, so it's a really kind of like challenging question. And we've got a couple of questions here, and I'm sure you could have a go at answering them. So I don't want you to write anything down, but have a little think. Could you describe how tumours form? Could you tell the difference between a malignant and a benign tumour? Could you describe how some tumours might spread to other parts of the body? And then the answers. The first one, as a result of uncontrolled or abnormal growth. That's how we get a tumour in the first place. Benign tumours don't invade or spread to other tissues, um, but malignant do. Um, and then we've got how do they spread via the blood or the circulatory system or they will accept the lymphatic system which I know they talked about in the video that we've just watched. So there's no reason why you couldn't answer those GCSE style questions based on what you've learned today in the lesson. Now 
the last bit, okay, of this work, okay, is what have you learnt today? Could you tell me what a tumour is? Could you tell me the difference between benign and malignant? Could you explain how cancer spreads and how we treat it? And could you apply your knowledge as we've just done to a past paper question? So we'd normally get you to discuss with your partner in class, with uh, somebody sat next to you, what you think you've managed to do with the traffic lights on here and what you think you found difficult and how you could improve the work. So I just want you to have a think about what have you learned today? Can you say that you've learned all of these objectives? Okay, or is there one that perhaps you, you'd like to go back and find out a little bit more about? So finally, right at the end of this lesson, we're just going to look at three other causes of disease very quickly. And some of these you've come across before in your year eight topics. So the first one is malnutrition. And there are five different types of malnutrition. We could have, you can have stunted growth. You can have wasting disease, okay, where um, you don't seem to be putting on any weight. You can be underweight. You can be overweight or obese, or you can actually have a deficiency in a particular mineral or vitamin. We call it a micronutrient deficiency. And I do apologize, my dog is snoring in the background, okay? So apologies for any noises you hear in the background. So back in year eight, when you did Food, Glorious Food, you learned about some of these disorders. So things like beriberi, rickets, and scurvy. They are normally due to one type of malnutrition. Malnutrition means not eating a diet that is balanced or has enough vitamins or minerals. So can you remember the vitamin that sailors were deficient in that led to them developing the condition scurvy, where their skin was poor, their teeth and their eyesight was poor? What was that vitamin that they were deficient in? Hopefully you can remember it was vitamin C because we did a task all about learning about scurvy and vitamin C. Some forms of what we call wasting malnutrition mean a person is not getting enough calories through their food intake. Now this can happen in less developed countries where we see people, um, particularly children, there are normally really distressing images of children that actually look like they've got a really big belly but their, um, their limbs are very, very thin and fragile and often they can't stand. The belly is not full of food. The belly is actually swollen and full of gases, okay, rather than food. Um, and so this happens where people can't access food easily. Perhaps there's war, perhaps there's famine, um, perhaps they've been forced to move from their country. So they might be in a refugee camp um, waiting for food to arrive from the United Nations or other charitable events that are trying to help these people but also we do see it in developing countries in people who suffer from anorexia too okay so those words can you please fill in for me please okay and lastly malnutrition can also be caused by eating too much of one particular food group um, so we often see this in people suffering from some forms of obesity okay they've got too much saturated fat in their diet the next disease we're going to look at is heart disease, okay? And again, back in OG, the oxygen molecules unit in year eight, you learn about some conditions that might um, increase your risk of heart disease. And this could be due to our lifestyle, okay? In some cases, not always, but in some cases. So I just want you to pause the video at this point and see how many factors, risk factors, you can write down that will increase your risk of potentially developing heart disease later on in life. Pause the video. So let's see how many of these you might have ticked off. So eating a diet high in saturated fats, or if you've said to me eating too much fast food, okay, too much, uh, too many chips, fat, chocolate, those types of things. Smoking increases the risk, drinking too much alcohol, okay, not exercising, or what we call a sedentary lifestyle, a sedentary lifestyle, okay, we don't move about too much, we just sit and, uh, you know, flick through Netflix as we have been doing over lockdown, okay. Increased weight gain and obesity. Sometimes a family history, inherited factors can influence whether or not we're more at risk from heart disease too. 
high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, which is a type of molecule that carries certain fats around the body. And so that can lead to an increased risk of this, what we call furring up of these arteries where they become narrower. Diabetes, um, not being able to control your sugar level very well. Age, as we all grow older, we increase the risk, that should say, of damaged arteries, spelling error in there. And gender, men are more at risk um, of heart disease up until a certain point. And then after the menopause, women, the risk increases for women as well. And the final one, stress. Stress can increase the risk of heart disease too. So the last type of group of diseases I'm going to look at today, because I want to leave all the bacteria, viruses, fungi and protests for next lesson, is disease caused by microorganisms. I want to look at something called a parasite, okay? So this group of infectious diseases that we're going to start today, but go on to next lesson, right, is caused by infectious diseases caused by infection by microorganisms. A parasite is basically an organism that lives off another organism. So cats often have fleas, okay? Um, cats can also get tapeworms, okay, and threadworms and roundworms. They are other types of parasites that your cats and your dogs can get too. And also um, animals that we eat for food, things like pigs and cows and even fish, okay, can have um, worms that live in various parts of um, their intestines. So the eggs get into your body if you get worms, okay, either by meat that's not been cooked properly or on food that's been touched by soily hands. Now, what we mean by soily hands is not hands that have got mud on them. Soily means dirty, yeah? So somebody perhaps has been to the toilet and has not washed their hands and then they're um, preparing your food for you, okay? Um, so if there are any eggs from tapeworms, okay, on that person's hands, they're gonna go onto your food. I know this is a really yucky subject to talk about, okay? What then happens is the eggs then hatch inside the body and the worms live in the intestine of the animal, okay, living on the host food, okay? So they have a whale of a time because they've got this constant stream of food coming through the intestine. So if we look at this example of this cat here, the cat might be grooming itself and eats a flea and the flea might be actually carrying um, the larvae of a tapeworm. The tapeworm is then going to go into the intestines of the cat and it's going to grow. And these tapeworms, some of them can grow really long, okay? They can grow 9 to 10 metres in um, some humans, okay, in their intestines. The end segments of the tapeworm contain the eggs, which are then excreted when the cat goes to the toilet. It's faeces, that's actually the American spelling of faeces, so there's the English spelling. And so where we have, unfortunately, cat poo, dog poo, okay, um, little children when they're playing outside, which is really not pleasant, if they pick things up, they can get some of these um, eggs on their hands and little children like to stick their hands in their mouth, okay, without washing their hands sometimes, okay, and that's how they get into the body. So fleas in the environment ingest the eggs perhaps before jumping on the cat, but also that's how they can pass to humans, okay, through feces that have been left behind by these animals. And so we know when our cat or our dog might need um, uh, worming, we call it, okay. Worming means that you have to get some medication, normally a tablet, okay, from the vets. And the worming tablet will cause the tapeworm to let go of the inside of the intestine and pass out with the animal's feces. But one of the sure signs that your animal needs worming is they tend to do what I call the itchy bum shuffle, okay? And the itchy bum shuffle is where you see your animal dragging their bottom along your carpet. Never very pleasant, okay? Because if there are eggs okay, on the animal's bottom, then they're going to go into your carpet and you might be sitting on the carpet and picking those up, okay? So always make sure your animals are regularly dewormed, okay, so that they're not likely to risk spreading um, tapeworms and threadworms and roundworms to you. So we're going to stop at that point, a really disgusting uh, topic to uh, end with today. And hopefully you've understood a little bit more about various diseases, but in particular, cancer. Okay. 
Thank you, Year 9.